I wanted to talk to you guys uh, about developing a sense of where you are orienting yourselves to the neuroanatomy and neurosurgical ORs that you're hopefully going to be spending a lot of time over the next seven years uh, working in. These are two of my favorite things and places, and I hope that uh, you enjoy this brief trip. Um, I'm the outgoing chief resident in neurosurgery at the University of Southern California and the upcoming fellow in pediatric neurosurgery at Texas Children's and at Baylor. Um, so this is gonna be 30 minutes. Um, we're gonna stop halfway through. Um, once we've covered all of uh, neuroanatomy, then we're gonna cover everything you'll ever need to know about the OR. Um, this is tailored for uh, clinical medical students, and I hope that this is also useful uh, for first and second year medical students as well. Um, really, more than anything else, uh, this is to overcome uh, the fact that we can't bring you guys to sit in this circle here uh, that, uh, you know, about a year ago, uh, we were able to uh, have uh, medical students and sub eyes and the entire county team um, in uh, what now looks like a very quaint image. Uh, and I'm sad for that loss, and I'm hopeful that uh, this can overcome some of that. Um, so um, how are we going to over, uh, overcome this time barrier and uh, cover all of neuroanatomy in 10 minutes or less? Uh, the short answer is that we're not. Um, we're going to talk about how we learn neuroanatomy and give you a couple examples and some pathways that you might like to follow and some tools that you can use to learn. Um, first, learning now is adult learning. That means that it's self-directed, self-selected, and self-paced. You're the ones who have to choose and decide how much you learn and what you study. That brings with it new challenges. Fortunately, by the time you're MS4s, you're all experts in learning how to learn. You've just spent four years developing that skill, and you can carry it with you throughout your lives. How you learn anything is how you learn everything. You'll learn what works best for you. And if you really pay attention to what works well in medical school, whether it's flashcards or writing down or drawing or reading or listening or doing, um, those things will carry through the rest of your life. Um, I want to share one thing that I found very important in my learning, um, which is the following saying, I heard and I forgot. I saw and I remembered, I did and I understood. And really a lot of neurosurgery and neuroanatomical learning is learning by doing. So um, this is uh, one of my favorite books uh, by John McPhee, A Sense of Where You Are. It's about U.S. Senator Bill Bradley's basketball career. Uh, and he was a player that was known uh, for the ability to not look at the basket and shoot or pass um, with extreme accuracy. And I think that in developing a neuroanatomical sense and being a successful neurosurgery resident, a lot of those same skills apply. You have to know what's going on around you. You have to know where you are almost without looking. And you have to be able to see things uh, that you can't even necessarily directly perceive through your eyes where you are right now. Um, so uh, what is there to learn? Uh, essentially everything. This is a picture from uh, the University of Bologna, which is the oldest continually operating university. Uh, more than a thousand years ago, they were founded. And they're still studying neuroanatomy there today, um, going from uh, cranial to peripheral nerve to spine, everything from exposure and approach uh, to vital structures uh, and uh, related anatomy. Um, so this is an extremely vast topic. Um, so I think it's important for you guys to pick uh, small bites and uh, just really dive deeply into that each small area um, and kind of go from there. Um, so surgery is real-time applied neuroanatomy. Um, so when you're watching this video of supercellular uh, dissection of this uh, pituitary adenoma, um, identifying the pituitary stalk, identifying the optic nerves, identifying the A1s, A2s, what perforators uh, are important, what vessels can be dissected, what can be sharply divided. These are all neuroanatomical uh, decisions that you have to make in near real time in order to achieve a very difficult but ultimately excellent um, outcome for this patient um, in the spine. You're going to go from the image on the left, uh, which is uh, a human back and a bunch of ribs with some screws that we put in there, um, to the image on the right, which is a completely 360 degree decompressed uh, thoracic spinal cord and cage placement with ligation of the th uh, thoracic nerve roots without injury to the lung, without injury to uh, great vessels, um, in order to restore this woman's ability to walk. So the question is, how do you go from one to the other? That's real-time applied neuroanatomy. Um, in the peripheral nerves, right? We all learn in anatomy lab about the ulnar nerve. But as you go through and do these dissections, um, working through Arcadive Struthers, Osborne's, other areas of compression, um, SEU, et cetera, these are all things that you'll need to know and understand and identify in real time. So these are some of the things that we've used uh, in the past. Um, so how do you do this? How do you learn? Um, 
the first and most important thing is recognizing that just as in medical school, this is an exercise in data management. Um, on the left is uh, one of Dr. Harvey Cushing's notes uh, from uh, about 100 years ago, December 1922, uh, describing his operation uh, of a uh, intracellular cyst. Um, it, uh, it includes a written description, it includes a drawing that he made in near real time, and it was saved and cataloged in a way that he could go back and look at it. Um, and similarly, uh, you know, we've tried to collect similar data uh, to save it, to update it, to look at it in a number of different formats using electronic advantages that Dr. Cushing never had. Um, we can have portable, um, easily accessible and easily shareable uh, information resources that can teach us a tremendous amount in a short period of time. Um, I want to really emphasize the importance of drawing and learning neuroanatomy um, because uh, that's uh, really an essential, essential way to develop that skill set. It doesn't have to be a pretty drawing, and you can see even Dr. Cushing, and I hate to say something bad about Harvey Cushing because who am I, um, but it's not, it doesn't have to be the most, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to make it on the wall of the Louvre, but it's incredibly accurate. It shows anatomical representations, and he did it for himself, um, and that's an important way uh, that you'll learn where these structures are. But recognizing that neuroanatomical learning is an exercise in data management that's going to begin now and continue through the rest of your lives. Um, recognizing that there's good resources for you. Um, what this isn't, this isn't Gross Anatomy Lab. Um, you're uh, going to need to call upon a vastly different group of resources that are immensely uh, functional and practical. Um, people have mentioned uh, the Neurosurgical Atlas, which is excellent, um, Dr. Roten's work, which is excellent, and a number of other surgical video resources. There's a, a great group of resources from the Seattle Science Foundation and the AANS, on, even on YouTube, um, that can be extremely useful, as well as a number of published uh, dissections uh, that are very important. Um, this is an example of something that I don't think is gonna be useful for you. It's a bunch of words, um, the descriptions are not incredibly clear, and it shows an idealized view of a human exterior. I don't really know from this description how to do this dissection. Um, conversely, um, if you open up a Fukushima uh, dissection manual, you'll see these beautiful pictures laid out in a surgical view with step-by-step -step technique of how you identify and progress through, in this case, um, a retrosigmoid uh, craniotomy. Um, and these are really amazing and wonderful, and you should treasure these and find these and ultimately make them your own and create them for yourselves. Um, but these are exactly the kinds of resources that you're going to want to seek out. Um, you're going to want to spend a lot of time in the lab. Um, it can be difficult as a medical student because you won't be the primary operators. So you can TA. You can TA uh, medical school classes, dental classes, PT and OT. Um, find a way to get in there and get hands-on. Um, and when you do, use the resources that are really excellent. Um, and uh, they don't have to be very expensive. This Cornell dissection manual is available for free on the internet. Um, and it's really a wonderful resource uh, and very surgically oriented. Um, and lastly, all of the Roten collection is available on YouTube um, with wonderful voiceovers. And it's a great way that you can stay connected to a wonderful tradition of neuroanatomy um, and learn a tremendously useful uh, uh, set of information. So um, we really love that. Um, and lastly, uh, and most importantly, is developing a team, um, starting and cultivating relationships, um, because those are the things that will keep you inspired and effective. Um, remember that you're not looking for people who are like you, but people who like the same things that you do. Um, and that's something that you kind of have to keep yourself honest on. Um, I think uh, this is, you know, this is our team um, at the county, and I'm extremely grateful to have worked with all these folks over the past year. Um, to give you one, uh, one very, very brief example um, is uh, how you can learn to do an uh, orbitozygomatic craniotomy. Uh, this is a talk that we gave uh, last year, um, but it just describes going from on the left, um, a sort of a cartoon or basic understanding of what approach selection you're gonna use to a step-by-step -step, uh, diagram that may or may not be exactly what you need, um, but that's extremely detailed. And then going on the right to a series of operative images so you can understand what the exposure is gonna get you. So as a medical student preparing for a case, you might use this kind of progression to go from your idealized drawing, having a resource in hand, and then having the operative images, but then you have to do something else, right? Then you have to go back. Um, and then you have to go back to the, uh, the original drawings and make your own um, and understand, maybe I missed that part of where's the superorbital nerve? How do I cut it out, 
right? Or what exactly are the cuts through the orbit? How do I do these things? Um, and it's your job to internalize this information by drawing, thinking, incorporating, making this yours by asking questions and then ultimately by answering them um, and seeking out others who can provide you with guidance along the way. And those are the things that I've been very, very grateful for um, across a number of uh, uh, different uh, learning opportunities. So um, I wanted to take a brief pause here um, to answer any questions that you guys have um, and uh, to say thank you guys for your attention. And I hope this is a subject that captures your interest and gives you some uh, brief overview of how to learn um, that you can then apply to all the wonderful resources and lectures that you'll hear going forward. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.